Imam Sarraj, are we in here by ourselves? Uh, As-salamu alaykum. Alhamdulillah, jazakallah. I first want, before getting into this, this brief talk, I want to commend the convention committee for organizing around this theme of just social justice, the scale of piety, I'm subhanAllah, the scale of Allah, piety and action. A lot of thought went into this particular theme and it really helps my heart. I feel very good that we would focus this year on social justice in a way that it brings the theme to us in a way that we're recognizing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has established for us these scales and social justice and our piety and our action balance one another off. That we have to have the personal piety, we have to have the personal ibadah, we need to perfect it to the best of our ability. But without action, without physically, mentally, emotionally putting into action, those things that our hearts are telling us what is hot and what is battle, then we're just going through rituals. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in giving us this perfected deen, would not want for you and I just to be those individuals that in our personal practice, we're commended for what we're doing, we're doing great things, but we are ignoring this establishment of justice here on earth, right here, right now, that this is the duty of every Muslim. And so this theme brings this concept together for us and all of the speakers that you've heard and that you will continue to hear will in one way or another address this particular theme, brothers and sisters in trying to understand what are our roles, what are our duties and responsibilities as Muslims in regard to this. You and I should pray, make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us hukum, gives us knowledge, gives us a wisdom, give us an understanding so that we understand how to apply the principles of Islam to the day, the time, the right here, right now, that we're not trying to live Islam on the pages of history. By that I simply mean that whatever was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu whatever he demonstrated in his behavior is for us to apply those principles, those actions right here, right now. We want to appreciate our righteous predecessors. But there are generations that will come after us who will look at what we did in the United States right here, right now. And if Allah grants us this understanding, then we will demonstrate to those who are coming after us and those who we are on this planet right now with a good example of how to apply the guidance of Islam to our lives right here and right now. Brothers and sisters, I just want to talk just briefly about the history of social change from an Islamic perspective in Islam. That history that was demonstrated through the life and the struggle of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and those who were with him, his Sahaba, those who were companions of the companions, the Tabi'in, 
that when we look at the history of social change on this planet, one thing jumps out at us. It's indisputable. And that is that no matter how righteous and how pious an individual may be, that we are not able to affect a genuine social change by ourselves. We know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could just say, kum fa kum. And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and those who were with him would not have to go through the persecution and the struggle that they went through if it were Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's will, his qadda, that you and I start off with a perfect society of human beings, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and the Sahaba would not have had to go to, through 23 years of struggle and sacrifice. Look at the history of this land. Look at the struggle that every generation of believers who were attempting to establish the Islamic way of life it was not based on a personality. It was not based on just individuals. It was a necessary collective effort. Brothers and sisters, when we dig a little deeper, we find that this was the case in every social change known in human history, not just with Muslims. I'll give you one quick example one that we may not think about often or may not be aware of. When you look at the history of South America and you find that early on and for so many decades, the Spanish had occupied and colonized the South American continent. And then there was a man that rose up by the name of Simon Bolivar. And Bolivar, was a very charismatic figure. He was a brilliant thinker. He was a brilliant strategist. And with Bolivar and others' leadership, we find that what now exists as six countries on the South American continent, that through the collective efforts of those in those affected areas and the leadership of Bolivar that he was able for a period to liberate what are now six South American countries from this imperial power, imperialistic power of Spain. When we look at the movement to establish Islam under the leadership of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there are some characteristics that I think we all should keep at the forefront of our mind that the movement to establish Islam under the leadership of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu was not an elitist movement. It was not a movement that was solely populated and led by those who had the highest positions in Meccan society. As a matter of fact, you and I know that the early days of those, that history, it was a history where I'm not going to say the majority, but a large percentage of those early respondents to the call of La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, were from the oppressed class. They were the miskeen, they were the poor. They were coming from positions of enslavement in society. They were being joined by the wealthiest and most respected people in the society that this first Islamic movement under the leadership of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu was an inclusive diversity that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala brought together. And we know that this, look at this Sunnah, look at this movement, what can we glean from this movement in our struggle today? And we see that it was not an elitist movement. It was inclusive of every element in the Meccan society and Medinian society, look at what we got from this, brothers and sisters. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in giving us this first Islamic movement, gave us a pattern for success. How do we bring about a change in right here, right now? How do we establish an 
inclusive diversity so that you and I can get the most out of our lifetime, out of our Islamic work. Brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us this deen not just as a personal practice but as an example given us guidelines as to how to bring about an establishment of this deen right here, right now. Let me fast forward to more contemporary times. And when we talk about the struggle of Islam in the Western Hemisphere and more particularly in these United States, we have to start by remembering and knowing that there were descendants of enslaved African people that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have these Muslims brought in the bottom of slave ships to this nation. And the people that were brought here, they were either part of a contemporary dynasty in Songhai in West Africa, or they were descendants of the Mali Empire, glorious Muslim empires on the continent of Africa, in West Africa. These are the lands that these early and later enslaved Africans were brought from. And so there was a history that was established for them. There was a pattern that if we are to practice our Islam, it involves struggle, it involves liberation, it involves trying to pass on this dino haq. Brothers and sisters, African people in this country today, and I'm one of them, Allah knows best whether or not any of my ancestors were Muslim or not. But the point is that the system of white supremacy, this government that was established by the so-called founding fathers in this country was based and rooted in white supremacy and it was initially a military state. And so those of us, those who are conscious of the history of this nation who are Muslim today, understand a, and must understand a responsibility to try to take everything we know, every resource that we have to bring about a change for the better, an Islamically influenced change here in the United States. Brothers and sisters, the history of Islam amongst African American people is a history of African people in this part of the world was a history that got disjointed. But now we have millions of people of African descent today who are struggling with this Islam, knowing our responsibility. Look at what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had produced from the African American Muslim community in relationship to taking a stand for justice. Look at the efforts, and I'll start with El Haj Malik El Shabazz with Malcolm X, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raised Malcolm as a gift to those who are against oppression, as a gift to the Muslims. And yet, here was a man that spent much of his younger life, and of course he was martyred before he was 40 years old, but here's a man that spent much of his life engaged in some form of criminal behavior, but from that depth of social life, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raised and elevated Malcolm that now He's a symbol for Islamic struggle, for martyrdom for the entire world today. Look at someone else that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raised in this African-American context, in this country. Look at Muhammad Ali. Everybody, I was in a, a Palestinian refugee camp a number of years ago, and it was before they closed down Gaza. I think it was in... Um, Jabalia, the largest refugee camp over there. 
and a, a, a young Muslim came up to me when someone told him that I was from the United States. And this was back in the 90s. And he came up to me and started, you know, like he was shadow boxing with me. And Muhammad Ali, Muhammad Ali. At first, I didn't know what, what he was doing because he just started like this. I said, oh, man, this guy's going to jump on me. But then I realized that he could not speak English, and this was his way of communicating with his Muslim brother, his African-American Muslim brother from the other side of Atlantic, that he too knew the role that Muhammad Ali played in the area of social justice and promoting this as an example. The worldwide, we have people in our midst, in our ranks today, like Imam Siraj Wahaj, who's known all over the world. Imam Siraj's life has been one of struggle for Islam and the establishment of deen. I think Imam, maybe since the 1920s, <laughs> that's touche. <laughs> that's a touche. But I think maybe, maybe after the 20s, but Imam Siraj is another example of struggle for justice in this nation is paramount to our being able to develop a healthy, positive Muslim community in this country. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us to take the stand for justice, it's not just a, a good idea. It's a command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you and I, regardless of our station in, life, in our lives, that you and I have this duty and responsibility to take a stand for justice following the divine guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and following this divinely inspired and driven uh, methodology established through the life of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And I just want to just mention, I would be remiss if I didn't mention this. And I see I'm on zeros, but just give me about another minute. And that is that today, Malcolm was martyred in 1965. Beyond a shadow of a doubt, he is the most notable Muslim martyr that this nation has produced. But we have a kind of living martyr in the personage of Imam Jamil Abdullah al -Amin. That he, like Malcolm, at a young age, once he recognized the goddess of Islam, and even before that had a lifetime from high school of committing to social justice, Imam Jamil was a person that before I met him, I was just hearing about how courageous this individual was before Islam. I had the opportunity to meet him in the late 70s and became what I consider a friend of Imam Jamil. But when I was doing certain works in south, the southern part of the United States as a, a trade union organizer, I was going into these backwood areas and people were saying, when they found out at that time I was living in Atlanta, do you know Rap Brown? Do you know H. Rap Brown? And I said, yeah, you know, I see him every week before I, I come down here to do this work. And they, without exception, when they realized that I knew uh, Imam Jamil, said that this was the most courageous human being that they had ever met in their lives, that his example, in the face of all kinds of oppression and racist attacks in southern Alabama, in Mississippi, in all of these areas, that it gave them their manhood. That grown African American men would say that I found my manhood through this man and his example. And that example has continued. So just in closing, brothers and sisters, you and I have much to learn and to benefit from, from examples like Malcolm X, from examples like Imam Jamil Abdullah al -Amin. We have much to learn from because the guidance of Islam is not limited 
to a particular nationality, to a particular ethnicity, to a particular race. So whatever good that we find, whatever example that we find that we can use, let's use it and let's take advantage of it. But let us leave this convention with a commitment to take the stand for justice, to be exemplars to our children, to our families, to the citizens of this country as to the revolutionary potential that Islam has in addressing and correcting the wrongs in American society. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs>